welcome to uh, what is the first in a series of events we're running on after 2015. Um, I have a sense that this is a topic which is we're going to be hearing a lot more about as we approach the deadline for the Millennium Development Goals and people start to dare to think about what might happen afterwards. Um, in terms of what we're trying to do in this series is really just to explore the terrain, see what's out there, what are some of the problems that the current crop of MDGs don't tackle that a new international development agreement after 2015 might need to take on and what are some of the ways that that could happen and also really to explore the politics obviously what a, a, a post-2015 agreement isn't a foregone conclusion it might, it might, nothing might happen at all so it's to, to start to see what are some of the dynamics what are some of the problems that a post-2015 international agreement on development could solve and why might people want to solve them in that way. So this is for us part of what will be a, a series of um, four or five meetings with flyers on your chairs with some of the others. But we're starting um, on optimistic notes. The sun is shining, it's spring, the crops are going forward soon. So we thought that uh, we would try to talk about things getting better and what we can learn from progress. We often define development and the kinds of things that, that we all do every day in terms of problems to solve. And we're, in a sense, looking at this from the other side today. What are some of the solutions that we know are out there, the ways in which things are getting better that we can learn from, translate to other environments? Um, this meeting is doubling up also as I think the London launch of Charles Kenny's new book. So we're very pleased to have Charles here from the Centre for Global Development in Washington where he's a fellow, he's also worked at the World Bank and I think a uh, long time ago in at ODI briefly. Um, we also have on my left, uh, my far left, Mila van der Morkene, who is a researcher here at ODI and has been working on the Development Progress Series project, which again has taken this approach of trying to you know, see where things are getting better and what we can learn from that. And on my right is Patrick Watt, who's the Director of Development Policy at Save the Children. Um, Charles is going to speak first, and then Mila, and then Patrick, and then obviously we'll have um, plenty of time afterwards for questions uh, and discussion. So over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so I am going to uh, present the book. The, the book, I like to think, uh, you know, is full of uh, amusing anecdotes and, uh, you know, takes a gentle tone. Um, I'm doing the whole thing in 25 minutes, so this will be somewhat more um, punchy, I hope. Uh, this is kind of the usual picture of the, the, the world um, uh, presented uh, by the media and others. Uh,
is, is Germany's GDP per capita as it developed over 200 year, uh, 150 years, pardon me, um, of history. Um, there are wiggles on, on the, the red line, which is uh, the, the course of GDP growth, uh, course of GDP per capita. Um, uh, the wiggles are uh, fairly obviously the biggest one is connected with the Second World War. But Right. Um, now, a lot has changed in Germany since 1870, especially when it comes to policies. So if policy change drove big changes in growth, you wouldn't expect that to be true. Oh, dear. Um, we do know something about how to be rich. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, countries ranked uh, along the bottom uh, by their, their income rank in 1820. So uh, the poorest country, which is Nepal, in the, in the, in the, in the bottom left um, at zero and zero, um, uh, and their income rank, same set of countries, uh, obviously in 2003. Nepal was the poorest country in uh, 1820. As far as we know, it's still the poorest country today. Uh, the, 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 the converse holds true. If you were rich in 1820, uh, you're quite likely to be uh, richer today. There are some exceptions. I think the, the dot furthest over um, to the left, which is high up, is uh, is Australia. Um, but as a rule, um, being rich in the past is a darn good thing for being rich today, and that tells you something about probably what's causing it, um, which is things that change very slowly over long periods, uh, which we tend to call institutions. Uh, this is the Supreme Court, as it happens. Um, the thing about institutions is they have uh, they're old. Uh, they have a a, a a a history attached to them. You know, Douglas North goes on about Charles V. That's the guy on the um, Right, um, you know, other people go on about the Magna Carta. That's the thing on the left. Uh, uh, other economists have sort of looked at the cross-country data on who's rich and who's poor, and they've said, well, in Africa at least, it's all about uh, s slavery. This is a picture of the the, the slave ship Wildfire. Uh, Bill Easterly says it's all about um, did you have magnets um, uh, and ocean-going vessels in 1500? If you didn't, you're in trouble today. Um, of course, uh, fans of uh, uh, Jared Diamond uh, will tell you yeah, it's not about magnets. It's about Pangaea. Pangaea breaks apart, um, and you get some continents that are long and some uh, some that are tall and some that are long. If you're in a long <laughs> continent, you're doing great. If you're in a tall continent, you're screwed. Um, so uh, we do know something about economic growth. It's that. Uh, I don't quite know the policy recommendations that, that, that come out of it, though. Um, Start digging. I go too far, obviously. Um, and you can tell why I go too far by looking at a picture of North and South Korea at night. Uh, North Korea is dark because there's no electricity. South Korea has lots of lights. Um, so we do know one thing. Um, you know, don't act like Kim Jong-un, or indeed uh, uh, don't obviously act like Robert Mugabe. Um, but that is about it. Uh, and, and really, I don't think um, an honest review of a literature on economic growth gets you too much further than that. OK, that was all the bad news. Good news. Uh, and there's lots uh, of good news. Um, we've had some fairly silly books out there recently about the Malthusian threat. One was called um, a, a Farewell to Arms. Um, uh, uh, by, a, by a scholar from, from, from uh, California that managed to say that most of the world was, was still in a, a Malthusian trap and that showed aid didn't work. I don't actually know how the two things were linked, but anyway, it's an awful book, don't read it. Um, <laughs> here is actually what a Malthusian situation looks like. It is uh, the history of British population and uh, wages between 1275 and 1775. Um, the, the line starts going to go back and forth, but it starts, it's the, uh, the, the bottom end point is where it starts. It then goes back up during the Black, pay, uh, black Plague, so uh, uh, Black Death, sorry. So population is going down, real wages are going up. And then uh, as we recover from the Black Death and, and, and you know, um, uh, fewer people die, uh, uh, populations go back up, but wages go down. That is your classic Malthusian story, right? Output is kind of fixed. And so if you've got more people, you've got less money per person. Malthusian story. Um, lots of people believe that much of the world is still in a Malthusian crisis. Here's what Ghana looks like over the last uh, uh, 80 or so years. Um, basically, it starts off bottom left and goes out. Right? I'm, I'm not saying uh, we couldn't have seen more income growth in, in Ghana. I wish we had. But we know we're not in a Malthusian situation because the population has uh, more than quadrupled um, and yet wages are going up, 
the, if we were in a Malthusian situation, wages would be going down. Um, so um, there's just no evidence of a sort of subsistence trap. This is data on population growth along the x-axis and, and GDP per capita growth along the y-axis. Uh, this is my favorite kind of graph where there's clearly no relationship. Um, <laughs> uh, in general, there's just not much evidence of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a poverty trap of any, any kind. Um, and indeed, there's um, uh, not much evidence uh, of any country in Africa really being caught in a, in a traditional Malthusian story. So we have plenty of evidence of slow institutional growth. Um, I, I, in Africa, and that being a factor behind slow income growth. But the Malthusian story, you know, let's all ignore the Reverend, please. He, 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 he was a, he's a bit of a, he wasn't a nice man, and I think we should just lay him to rest. Um, okay, so that's good news, no Malthusian traps. There's better news. Um, now, Africa is still very poor, and that is a problem, and we need fewer people uh, living on $1.25 a day, and some Good news is that number's been going down recently, but not fast enough. There are still more than 3 billion people who live on $2.50 a day. That is not enough. Um, we need more income growth. But the good news is that if you look at almost any other indicator of progress in the quality of life, the picture is just massively positive. Um, take in for mortality. This actually is uh, from a, a picture of a gravestone um, from, from a cemetery in Delaware. I, visited. I don't spend a lot of time in cemeteries, but anyway. Uh, uh, what you can see on it is, is there are a lot of kids on there who died pretty much within um, a, a year or two of being born. Um, next door uh, uh, is another uh, set of uh, kids who died um, uh, 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 incredibly young, um, at, in, I think before their first birthday. In, in the old days, in countries rich and poor alike, uh, lots and lots of kids died before their first birthday. Lots of kids. I mean, you know, a quarter, a fifth. Um, here's a picture of what's been happening in Costa Rica and the United States uh, since 1920 in terms of infant mortality. Uh, at the start of the century, one in ten kids in, in, in the United States was dying um, before their first birthday, and about one in four kids in, in, in Costa Rica were dying before their first birthday. You can see by the end of the century, I mean, you, there are still too many uh, kids dying before their first birthday um, in both the United States and Costa Rica, but the numbers are teeny in comparison to where they were at the start of the century. Um, um, and, and this is true of you know, even countries world and has seen uh, negative income growth over the last uh, 40 years or so. This is a picture of my daughter uh, from uh, 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 three years ago now. Um, uh, and I am very happy to say she's still you know, happy and healthy. Um, last week in Niger, this many kids were born who will survive to their first birthday due to improvements in, in child health in Niger over the, uh, over the period since 1960. Um, that is 42,400 um, uh, Alex's, that's the name of my daughter, 42,400 uh, babies yearly in Niger, a country of about 10 million. Um, so you know, multiply that up by all the rest of the planet. You get you get some really pretty big numbers. Um, indeed, you get about nine million kids will survive to their first birthday this year, who would have died if we had the infant mortality rates we had in the 1960s. That that's just great. <laughs> um, I've talked a lot about health. It's not just about health. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, global private primary enrollment uh, has has increased everywhere over the last uh, a few decades and. Um, the great thing is, as is true with health, rates of progress have been faster in places further behind. So the story with income is one of uh, divergence, rich countries growing faster, faster than poor countries. The story with almost anything else is a story of convergence, those countries further behind catching up. Um, true of education, it's true of rights, it's true of violence, it's true of access to infra infrastructure, it is even true of beer production. It is true of everything, <laughs> pretty much. Um, so there, there, there hasn't been growth some places. Um, uh, there has been uh, 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 a lot of quality of life improvement everywhere, um, which means quality of life must be getting cheaper. There is no other way that story makes sense. Um, that's not a particularly new fun finding. This is a Preston curve uh, called after Samuel Preston, who sort of uh, started drawing these pictures a while ago. Um, so it's infant mortality against income. Uh, infant mortality is lower in poor countries than it is in, in, sorry, lower in rich countries than it is in poor countries at any one time. But what's fascinating about the Preston curve, and there's the you know, regression line, is here's where that line was in 1900, here's where that line was in 1940, 
And here's where that line was in 2000. So at the same income, you are seeing dramatically improved health outcomes. No growth, huge improvements in quality of life. Same story with education. So this is uh, income against primary enrollment in, in 1900 and in 2000. And as you can see, very poor countries in 1900 had nobody in school. Very poor countries today have lots of people in school. Um, same income levels. Um, so even countries that get poorer are seeing improvements in quality of life. Uh, this is a Central African Republic. Um, income down a third, life expectancy up uh, from 39 to 44 years. And I could go on. Cote d'Ivoire, Haiti, Liberia. Liberia income drops around 91%. Life expectancy still goes up. Madagascar, Nicaragua, Niger, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Venezuela, exception, Zambia, uh, the, 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 the crisis of AIDS, um, and Zimbabwe. In both these places, they've seen falling income and falling life expectancy. They are the two exceptions. I have just presented to you, by the way, all of the countries on which the World Bank has data um, for income in 1960 and 2005, which were poorer in 2005 than they were in 1960. I'm not you know, uh, picking winners, if you will. And it's not just health. This is the, the story with um, Polity, which is a, uh, a measure, take it as you will, uh, of, of political rights across countries. Um, according to polity, for what it's worth, political rights have improved almost any, everywhere in these countries. Sorry, as I say, that's all the negative growth countries. So how, how can it be? Well, it's because income growth doesn't, isn't the driving force behind changes in quality of life growth. This is a picture of uh, income change against infant mortality change. It's another load of dots. Um, Quality change, same picture. Try drawing a line through that. Um, there is, of course, an exception. Carbon dioxide output goes up much faster in countries that grow faster. Uh, but, but you know, apart from that one negative, uh, it's hard to get any positives uh, uh, lining up really well with income growth. If not income, then what? It's a story of technology and ideas. Uh, take advances in health. This is a, a, a picture of um, a doctor treating a case of love sickness uh, from the Dutch Golden Age. Um, uh, uh, you know, the patient was clueless, clueless enough to think the doctor could help that. Uh, the doctor was clueless enough to think that he could help that too. Um, you can see somebody in the background holding up a dead fish. I think uh, you know, even back then there was suspicion. Um, uh, that's all changed. Medical advances really have made a massive difference to the quality of life. This is a picture of somebody with smallpox. We will hopefully never see that again. Um, and it's because of a very simple jab. Um, uh, uh, the percentage of uh, infants worldwide that have been immunized has shot up from you know, way below 10% in 1974 to um, uh, close on 80% in, in, in 2000. Just huge progress um, in, in the spread of health technologies. And it's not just health technologies, it's really simple ideas like wash your hands. Um, and so a randomized trial in Karachi um, a combination of handing out a bit of free soap and explaining why it was a good idea to use it uh, reduced cases of diarrhea by um, half uh, in Karachi, um, in the areas that they, they, they did the randomized trial. Um, oral rehydration therapy alone, I'm talking about sugar and salt in water, and the water doesn't even need to be clean. Oral rehydration therapy alone, if everybody knew how to use it, would, would, would instantly cut child deaths worldwide by 15%. This stuff is cheap, right? It's not hard. And it is about getting these simple ideas out there. So this is a uh, picture from Bangladesh. Of uh, It basically says, don't come to our village and shit in our fields. Sorry, but that is pretty much what it says. Um, uh, and uh, there's been some amazing work going on um, uh, by NGOs in, 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 in Bangladesh, just spreading sort of the message of, of, of what shitting in fields means um, in, terms of, in terms of health. And it's had m far more effect on, on uh, using sanitation facilities than actually just going in, digging a hole and building a pit latrine. Um, you know, if, you if you explain better to people why it is this is a good idea, they'll build their own pit latrine, thank you very much. Um, it's the importance of the, the sort of the demand side, understanding why it matters. Um, and we've seen lots of interesting ways of stimulating demand beyond just going and talking to people. You know, conditional cash transfers are a demand stimulation advance, uh, 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 demand stimulation technique you pay people to do the thing you want them to do. They've been hugely effective around, around the world for a bunch of different things, for vaccinations, for education, um, uh, for, for, for lots of different things. Um, and it's not just health. Um, it's uh, also obviously about um, uh, uh, education um, in that um, uh, the idea 
that your girls should be in school is the new normal worldwide. Um, and there is no way you could have said that 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, it is just commonly believed now that your girls should be in school. And that is the real thing behind massively um, improving uh, 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 rates of school enrollment for girls. Um, you know, building schools in a way is the easy part, it's just bricks. Changing attitudes is a bit harder, but it's happened, and it's happened remarkably rapidly. Um, it's wonderful. Um, <coughs> what's also changed, I think, is attitudes towards, um, you know, what should you expect your government not to do, um, uh, uh, sort of human rights. And, I mean, recent events in the Middle East speak to this, right? I mean, it's, it's not that suddenly the Middle East got rich. It didn't. Um, indeed, if anything, the Middle East has been getting poorer. It's just the idea is now much more current that you should expect certain things of your government which do not involve your government shooting you. Um, and that, that has become the normal expectation, I think is a real driver of progress and something that we you know, considerably under, uh, underappreciate as a rule. So what's behind the spread of ideas and the spread of technologies? Well, uh, I mean, I think one, one, one thing is, is, is better communication. So this graph just shows uh, it's <coughs> income again uh, uh, along the x-axis and, and the number of telephone subscribers for just African countries. Now, it, what it says is between 1980 and 2005, the number of uh, uh, telephones you'd have, even if you'd seen no income growth, would have gone up 100 times in your average African country. And it's true of TV and of, of radio and of all sorts of other communications technologies. They have spread like wildfire. When people get electricity in rural areas of developing countries, the first thing they do is they buy lights. The second thing they do is they buy a TV. And that has actually had a positive, almost positive impact on the quality of life. There are a number of, of, of fascinating studies showing that as TV rolls out across um, countries, um, people start watching soap operas which feature uh, uh, female characters who have control over de decision making about money and who is sending their girls to school and what follows that is a whole load of people saying well hang on if that's happening on TV why isn't it happening in my household um, and it leads to um, you know careful studies show that it, it leads to really dramatic changes in attitudes in particular towards women which is you know, great um, what does all this mean for policy um, well, I think one thing is the, the, the traditional and indeed, I think, increasing focus um, after a sort of a break for the MDGs, if you were, uh, uh, if you will, um, is to think about development as economic growth. Um, and I think that's a bad idea, especially for the aid community, for two reasons. One is we're not very good at changing economic growth. And so if we set ourselves that target, we're going to fail a lot. Um, the second thing is you don't need economic growth for sustainable improvements in the quality of life. And so actually if what we care about is you know, the quality of life of people uh, around the world, we don't just need to think about income. We can think about a bunch of different things. Now, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons I love the MDGs, because obviously they're all about saying income matters, but so does a lot of other stuff. And you know, by golly, whatever happens after 2015, I hope that remains. Um, I think that's just wonderful. Um, I'd also say uh, this suggests the importance of thinking about the demand side of development. Now, you've got to be careful there. I, I am talking about changing people's opinions, right? Uh, this, this can be paternalistic, uh, probably is paternalistic. Um, uh, uh, you know, th th there's, a, there's a danger that, that by trying to change pe people's opinions, you're actually changing the other way. It's not, it's not a straightforward um, uh, thing to be talking about, and, 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 and we need to be careful about it. But again, really, we do need to think more about how do we make good outcomes the normal thing to expect. Um, as it might be sending <coughs> girls to school, as just, <coughs> of course, you send your girls to school. Um, uh, and a final thing is, is celebrate success. I mean, you know, that's what this is about. But um, I really think it's time to give up the idea of constantly calling crisis. We've been doing that in the A community for 60 years. At some point, somebody's going to wake up and go, you've been saying it's in crisis for 60 years. We're still in crisis. What good are you? <laughs> and you know they would have a point, mm -hmm. except for the fact that things you know, really are getting better. I think point it, it may be time, maybe, to try a new strategy, which is to say, look, actually, we've achieved a hell of a lot. There's still a long way to go. There are still far too many you know, kids dying needlessly. There are still 
far too many people are living on, on far too little money. Um, but, you know, we really have got a lot of successes here to build on. We kind of know what we're doing. So, you know, help us do more. Maybe we should try that. Thank you very much, Charles.